Sick of harsh looking grow lights that stop working after a few months and don't seem to make that much difference to the growth of your plants? If that's you, it's time to give Soltec Solutions a try. Their modern, sleek, photosynthetic plant lights give off a warm white glow and come with a five year warranty so you can be sure they are going to last. You can choose from Soltec Solutions' range of track lights, pendant style lights, or a simple bulb that screws into most standard light fittings. And you'll love Soltec Solutions' great customer service too. Check out Soltec Solutions lights now at soltecsolutions.com and get 15% off with code on the ledge. That's soltecsolutions.com. Enter code on the ledge for 15% off. Hello and welcome to On The Ledge Podcast. I'm recording with the door open today because it's springtime. I fear I may have been listening to too many musicals. This is On The Ledge Podcast, the show that has chlorophyll pumping through every vein. And in this week's show, I talk to Aaron Apsley about the delights of painting all the beautiful houseplants we love. And I answer a question about book learning on pests and diseases. As you know, if you listen to the show regularly, I do love to blow my own trumpet. I mean, literally, I did used to play the trumpet as a teenager. (laughs) But I also like to tell you about my wonderful achievements. And one of the things I'm most proud of that I've done so far in the houseplant realm is write Legends of the Leaf, my forthcoming book being published by Unbound and crowdfunded by you lovely people. If you have not yet pre ordered your copy, there is a 20% off discount code available this Easter weekend 2022, and it's Easter 22. Yes, just use code Easter 22 on checkout and you'll get 20% off the rate for whatever package you choose up to the value of a hundred pounds. So if you haven't pledged for the book, this is a good moment to do so. And if I were you, I would have your eye on the postcard pack reward level, which gets you the book and also a pack of 25 postcards, each one illustrated by one of the beautiful pictures from the book by Helen Entwistle. So do go and check that out. I'll include all the info in the show notes at janeperone.com. And if you've already pledged, then please do let me know what questions you want me to answer in my upcoming author video just for people who have pledged. I want to know what you want to know about this book. And thanks to Crystal, Elizabeth and Paul, who all became legends this week, supporting me on Patreon, unlocking two extra chunks of audio every month in the form of an extra leaf and ad free versions of the main show. Check out the show notes for details on how to join them. And if you haven't subscribed to The Plant Ledger, my new email newsletter on the UK houseplant scene, crack on and get it done and unlock your free in-depth guide to fungus nap. That's enough ambling through the preamble. It's now time to meet my guest this week, Aaron Apsley. I'm Aaron Apsley. I'm a botanical artist and illustrator. I specialize in House plants and tropical plants. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Apsley Watercolor, and I sell my prints and my artwork on my website, AaronApsley.com. This sounds like a dream job. You're combining your profession of being an illustrator with your personal love of plants. How did that come about? Yeah, it's been a lifelong journey. I uh, always, since I was a child, 
always was the type of kid who, like, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said I wanted to be an artist. And um, I was always painting and drawing and interested in the the natural world. I mostly, if you caught me drawing as a kid, I was drawing an animal or I really liked dinosaurs and things like that. So um, I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to be a botanical artist, but at the same time, I was surrounded by plants and nature and had appreciation for plants as a child. My dad is actually a, a forester or a tree expert, basically. So I knew a lot about plants and trees as a kid and had an appreciation for that. Um, so I did, and I had a lot of encouragement from my parents, thankfully, uh, to become an artist. So I pursued that and I went to college for it. I studied illustration and somewhere along the way, I, you know, those things came together and I started, um, painting plants. And so after I graduated college, uh, with an art degree, I uh, moved to New York city. And I think that's really where, when I was living in a small apartment there and for the first time in my life, I was kind of away from nature and away from plants more than I ever had been is I think when I really realized that that's what I, one of my real passions in life is plants basically. And I started painting, well, for most of the while I was in New York, I painted succulents were, were my main focus because honestly, that's the only thing I had room for in my apartment is a bunch of little succulent plants. I didn't have room for any plants bigger than that. So I would go to all the plant shops and the botanical gardens and anywhere I could find, you know, anything to use as reference. And that's when my career as a botanical artist really started is just at the time I was doing landscapes. I didn't know what type of art I wanted to do. But once I started painting those plants and, and just realizing that's what I really had a passion for, that's what I kept doing. And then about three years ago, my wife and I got the opportunity to move to Florida, which is where I live now. And that's opened up, of course, such a whole new world of tropical plants and having my own garden. And it's just uh, really been a fulfillment of being able to paint all kinds of tropical plants and do a lot more stuff other than just a few succulents on my windowsill. So it's been great. Tell me a bit about how you work. I see lots of illustrators who've gone very digital in their approach to creating plant-based art, if I can put it that way. Do you still prefer the analog? Traditional watercolor painting, it, it is the, well, it's the traditional way of doing botanical uh, artwork going back hundreds of years. And that's not not the primary reason that I started doing watercolor. I, I um, have a lot of experience. Like I said, when I was a child, I, I was doing, I learned to do all these different techniques and watercolor and pencil and, and all the, so I have a lot of experience in that, those areas. Um, but it's just something I decided to stick with because I really enjoy working with my hands and using the materials and I get a lot of satisfaction from that. And, you know, with plants, you're working with pigments and the materials themselves are in a certain extent, not completely, but they are derived from plants. The binder and watercolor is a gum from a tree. You know, I just feel like I'm connected to the materials you create this physical object that you can hold in your hands. It's not just a file on a computer. Um, and, you know, a lot of the art world, since I was in college, most people my age and younger have moved to a digital field. And I use a lot of digital tools in my work. It makes, or in my day-to-day uh, -day workflow, it does make things easier. I post my work online. I use those tools and my other freelance jobs and things, but I also just get a lot of satisfaction out of the physical, traditional painting. Yeah. And I love seeing on your Instagram, when you post, you've posted reels and things of your actual, you, you at work, which I find really, really fascinating. What are you working on right now? Are there any big projects you've got underway? Well, I just finished a big project and I'm trying to figure out what's next. Uh, I always have a big list that's kind of 
in the back of my mind and I try to write out, you know, what can I paint next? And so I, I was just uh, earlier today painting some begonia leaves, which are a bit of a challenge, but always fun. Why are begonia leaves a particular challenge? There's incredible textures to begonia. Most, not all of them, they're, they're very diverse. Some of them are rather simple, but, you know, any type of Rex begonia or anything like that has scales and hairs on them and the shapes themselves are weird they're not symmetrical the way most leaves are so you really have to study them and i go all over the place looking for reference photos and reference plants and so and the colors are obviously crazy with begonia so they're very different from painting i'm just painting the leaves right now it's very different from painting a philodendron or something like that that a lot of times it's just green and, and glossy and so you, you have a lot more going on with the begonia i think you're perhaps best known on instagram certainly for for your aroid um images and i know you did a uh, an aroid print in collaboration with uh the wonderful nse tropicals tell me a bit about that yeah and it's really amazing i reached out to her a few years ago when i first you know got to florida and I wanted to do these illustrations that, like I've done these taxonomy prints of the different Monstera species and the different philodendron species and Alocasia and Therium. And I wanted to, whenever I do that type of thing, I want to see all these plants in person. I want to take photos and study them and study the textures. And I, I rarely paint anything that I haven't been able to take my own photo of it. Like I need my own photos for reference. I can't just take the first photo on the internet and just go off of that. You know, that's unethical as an artist to do that. So I reached out to Enid because I thought who better to look at a big collection of anthuriums and philodendrons than someone like Enid. And she was kind enough to uh, let me come over and take a bunch of photos. And it was uh, so helpful. I couldn't have done a lot of the work that I've done without you know, people like her who help me with that type of thing. Um, I actually helped her. I did the, the logo in the NSC Tropicals. There's a Monstera leaf that I painted for her a few years ago uh, as part of her logo. And then she suggested doing a, a new T-shirt design. And I based that on the beautiful living walls that she has at her nursery of just covered in aeroids. They're absolutely unbelievable. So I took a bunch of photos of those. And I've kind of made a, an imaginary image of all the plants growing together that she has and painted that and got it on a T-shirt, got it on a print. So that was a lot of fun. That sounds amazing. And I know lots of listeners are going to be wishing they were with you for that NSE Tropicals visit because I can imagine her place is, as I like to say, a cornucopia of delights, a phrase I overuse. It's not like uh, open to the public for very understandable reasons. Yeah, of course. And, and Enid is a very busy person. It's a really a one person operation and she is incredibly hardworking, but she's very nice and I admire her a lot uh, because of she's built this really incredible business pretty much by herself. So she's, she's a wonderful person. The reason why you're painting so many aroids because you're in Florida and you enjoy the challenge. But also, I imagine they might be your best sellers given how popular aroids have been in the last few years. Yeah, um, that's you'd be correct about that. Um, they are very popular. Um, I started painting aroids out of a personal interest moving to Florida and I, you know, wanted to grow them myself. Uh and I started going out to the local nurseries and, you know, suddenly after living in New York, it was, it seemed like a fun opportunity to have some, I've literally got trees in my yard with philodendrons and monsteras and things just climbing up them because, you know, wh why, why not? So that was my own personal collection that I started painting at the beginning of this. And I think it was very much a coincidence with me moving to Florida and, you know, some of the plant trends of the last few years happening at the same time. And that's what I was growing and that's what I wanted to paint and popular with my audience and everything. So 
Yeah. And that works quite well then. In the, obviously, there's been a intersection between those two things rather than you thinking, I really want to be drawing Gizneriads, uh, my, my favourite thing. <laughs> but actually, I've got to draw Aroids because they're the thing that everyone wants to buy. Um, I guess that's it. you've avoided that by actually there being a great intersection between those two things. I mean, please draw some Gizneriads, though. Can I, requ- <laughs> can I request that? <laughs> I've been lucky in that, but, you know, I... To be honest, I, I, I know that you, you've mentioned variegated plants are not your favorite and, and they're not easy to paint. I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> so I really don't feel the desire to sit around painting just uh, whatever the trendiest new uh, variegated thing is. So I really haven't even done that many of those. I, I love all plants and there are a lot of things that I want to paint that I am painting that may not be the trendiest thing and I'd love to paint some Gesneriads and I just did I, I want to paint some of the native plants in Florida that you know and I've got time to do it all of it so I'm well th- that's not always true but eventually I will have time to paint all of the plants hopefully so so I, I'm working on all kinds of different things you know I can imagine that some Gesneriads might be quite challenging because you know with the the sort of the hairs on the leaves how do you depict that? I can imagine that might be quite a challenge, actually. I've got my my technique. Sometimes what you do for something like that is watercolor is, is transparent. And traditionally, uh, you've got to employ different techniques to get little details. And, and But one thing that I you can do is get what's called a gouache, which is basically like watercolor, but it's got some opaque uh, white pigment in it. So you can just get white watercolor and get little uh, hairs in like that with uh, a little bit of white paint so kind of breaking the rules of watercolor but i you know there are there are techniques and i i like to i like to break the rules a little bit if you know because i'm not always doing the most traditional i've never been trained in the in the way that they used to do botanical illustration hundreds of years ago i'm not self-taught as an artist, totally, but I'm self-taught in the ways of botanical art. I just paint what's in front of me at whatever way I know how. So I, I figure it out. I'm always talking on the show about observation and the way that it's key to plant care. And I mean, I guess that's also the key to art. Does that mean you're good at looking after your plants as well? Because you're good at observing them? That's a very interesting question. Um, I, I definitely think I do have an eye for detail in general. I'm just like a very visual person. Uh, you know, more than, uh, anything else. But when it comes to looking at plants, you know, I, I, I think I'm good at identifying plants and remembering how things look and going out and remembering what the names of plants and stuff, just because I remember what they look like. And when it comes to taking care of them, Maybe I remember what a pest looks like or a certain type of uh, disease or something. I can visually identify it, but I don't think that necessarily makes me good at taking care of plants. It it really comes down to experience. You know, I've only been growing plants in this environment for a couple of years. And before that, I I didn't really grow up with house plants so much or taking care of plants that much. So it's something you have to develop the trial and error over time. And I've got a lot of experience painting, but plants are something I'm still learning a lot about. So I believe you've also been doing some work on a book by a former guest of the show, Michael Perry. What are you allowed to tell me about that? I don't think it's out yet. Yeah. Um, your listeners in the UK, uh, may be familiar with Michael Perry, uh, AKA Mr. Plant Geek. He is working on a book that will be out October 4th. It's called Hortus Curious. And I um, am illustrating the entire book. So it's a bunch of watercolor illustrations of different plants. I, I don't think I can say much more than that, but it was a big project, a lot of work. I recently kind of wrapped on painting all of that stuff. So that's if I've been a little MIA from some <laughs> of my normal stuff over the past few months, that's what I was working on. And I'm very excited to see the final product. So it's been, it was, it was a lot of fun. I can sympathize with the MIA. Yes. Books take a heck of a lot of time yeah. and energy, whether you're writing or illustrating. It's uh, amazing the work that goes into them. More 
from Aaron Shortley, but a short and sweet Q&A today. Jason got in touch to ask if there were any good books about houseplant pests and diseases. And I'm afraid the answer is not that I know of if you're talking about specifically indoor pests and diseases. There isn't a book that I found that covers just uh, the indoor pests that we all know and despise. The book that I recommended to Jason is called Royal Horticultural Society Pests and Diseases. There are various editions. Try to get the most up-to-date one because the information has changed over the years in terms of what pesticides are currently licensed and so forth. And again, if you're in the UK, this book is probably most relevant to you. If you're outside the UK, There may be things in here that are not licensed in your country and there may be things excluded from this book because they are licensed where you are, but not in the UK. So it's all very confusing. But the RHS Pests and Diseases book is a great place to start. It covers indoor and outdoor, but it goes into a good amount of depth and it will help you with your plant problems if you happen to prefer a book rather than going online. If you're in the US, there is a book. I don't have a copy of this, but I have seen it recommended before, which is Westcott's Plant Disease Handbook by R. Kenneth Horst. It's quite an expensive book, so possibly one you might want to pop to the library and borrow. If you've got any other recommendations for pest and disease books about houseplants and plants more generally, then do let me know. Most of the good houseplant books have got a pest section, but not a whole book dedicated to them. So perhaps someone's writing one right now. I do not know. But if you know better, please let me know. Otherwise, that RHS book is a good bet if you are in the UK. If you've got a question for On The Ledge podcast and my good self, do drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com and I will endeavour to help. And now let's get back to my chat with Aaron. And I wanted to get onto the subject of patrons. Both of us have support from our followers via Patreon. Does that impact on your work in a particular way in terms of your future plans being shaped by what patrons are telling you or getting that feedback? How does that interaction affect what you do? Well, it's been an amazing experience getting support for my work over the years. Um, I'm mainly supported through my print sales and selling my work, you know, online, originals and uh, other products. Um, I did, I started the Patreon a few years ago during kind of in the early days of the pandemic. And actually it came about um, as a result of COVID, my wife lost her job, actually. Um, And that's the reason we moved to Florida originally was for uh, a job that she got down here. And so that went away. And ever since then, my wife has been working full time with me on our, you know, business with the artwork. And I it's amazing to me that we you know, to be able to support ourselves with this. And I'm so grateful to everybody who, you know, has been supportive. And that's just, it it blows my mind how much people, how supportive everyone is. So the Patreon was partially something she thought would be, uh, you know, a good idea. Like like many things that I've done over the years, uh, she comes up with good ideas. And the biggest benefit to Patreon for us and for me is that it gives a lot of structure to how we work our, our year and and month to month because it's a monthly thing. For my Patreon, we do physical rewards. So I send out to my level two subscribers um, an envelope with stickers and miniature prints and things like that every month. And just having that as a goal each month to work on what are we going to do for that? What, uh, bonus content behind the scenes I post about my garden, you know, just having that as a something to work towards every month. So we're not totally aimless on 
what are we going to do next? What are we going to work on? I think people often sort of think that for me doing a podcast, oh, how fun. You're just chatting to people. That must be really nice. I'm not sort of asking for sympathy here, but you know, it's that thing of, it seems like a really nice job, but actually there's a lot of hard work that goes on behind the scenes. I'm sure it's the same for you with art in that people just think you're sort of wafting along doing beautiful watercolors, but actually it's a slog sometimes. I'm very grateful for for it, but it it, it is is work. Um, it's a lot of hard work, and it's very time consuming. And I think being self employed, as much as it has huge benefits, is the one major downside. Is that you're 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 always working, and there's always something that I can be doing. I I always feel like, well, if I'm not painting, then I should be. You know. <laughs> um, a lot of people say that when you do what you love, that it kind of ruins that. Like you should keep what you love as your hobby and not your job because it can ruin your your passion for that thing. And I think where I'm lucky is that my secret passion of what I really get joy out of in my life is the plants. The painting, the artwork is the job. And what brings me the joy is the being around the plants and getting to work with the plants and getting to go plant shopping and going to a nursery as like a part of my job. Like that's what keeps me going. And that's what is really, I feel it lucky to be able to do that. So I just am a huge uh, plant nerd, I guess. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. More than an art nerd. You know, I don't, I don't sit around looking at other, at like paintings or going to museums. You know, I just. What advice would you give to anyone who thinks I want to channel my arty side and my love of plants. And I, I don't, I've never done any sort of drawing before, but I want to start drawing my plants. Can you offer up some advice for those people about where do you start? Particularly if you've got a bit of fear of thinking, oh, I'm like, I would be like, I can't draw, but I want to, I want to do this, but I don't know where to start. Well, how I started out with the plants at least was just painting the plants that were nearby to me. Um, I, like I said, when I was in New York, I had started collecting Haworthia in particular because they were growing well in the like kind of low light conditions of the apartment. And one day I just kind of looked over and said, I'm not really appreciating this plant enough. It's just kind of sitting there. I don't even know anything about it, but I did some research on it. I thought that's really cool. And then I, I did a painting of it. And I think the key is like you said earlier, observation, and I would recommend to answer your question for somebody who's new to this, really make an effort to paint from life uh, a plant. It's, it's, it's not always easy, but it's going to make you a better artist. And to actually paint the plant in front of you, you can see the detail, you can see all the color. Um, don't, you know, go and just like pull a photo off of Google, pull, you know, pull the variegated monstera leaf off of Google because it's pretty, you know, that's not going to teach you how to, how to draw. Um, go out, even if you're just go out on the street and clip a branch off of a tree and it's just some leaves or something, and then just study the shapes of that, get to know the, the plant and how it grows and really try to observe it and look at it. And that's, that's how you would teach yourself to, you got to see it. I think that's great advice. And I imagine there might be some listeners to this who would love to make a connection between their planty passion and maybe some kind of creative skill that they have. Uh, I think you're probably making it look quite easy, but actually making that work and making a living at what that kind of thing is hard. How have you built up such a great following on Instagram? Have you, have you got a strategy or have you just been putting up what you like, which is my kind of approach? Well, that's stuff. Um, I started quite a long time ago with, with Instagram in particular. I mean, this is something I've been working on for a long time. Doesn't happen, you know, overnight. I did start Instagram, oh gosh, in 2014, maybe 2015, I guess, maybe in more like 2015. And it took a while and you know I I did different things and some things worked and some things didn't and I think it was probably easier to be honest back then even than it is now to get 
noticed because there were less people doing that sort of thing than there are now probably. Um, and I think Instagram also is, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people complaining that the platform is dying out a little bit. Not as many people are using it. doesn't seem like so, you know, I don't know what the next thing is going to be. Um, but you know, it's, that's fine. You know, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Not going to get too, uh, worried about that, but I think that's the struggle, isn't it? Is you kind of, as a creative person, feeling like you've got to be always on to the next thing and trying to predict what's going to happen and get ahead of it, which is hard. Yeah. And I'm not the kind of person who naturally enjoys putting myself out there. You know, I'm a fairly private person by nature, so that's not something that came natural to me. Um, but it, as a self-employed artist, uh, never going to make a living if, People don't know that you're, for a while, I was just literally sitting in my New York apartment every day painting things and then just not posting them on the internet, just putting them in the drawer. And at a certain point, my wife said, uh, you know, you should start an Instagram account or put them online somewhere so that somebody can maybe buy them or something. So, um, you know, you got to put yourself out there and, and make an effort. And I do that to the best of my ability. So I'm sure there's, again, there's more I could be doing in that department to promote myself and uh, sell my work and and but it's always takes an effort a mental effort if nothing else to do all that stuff you're a self-confessed plant nerd now lots of listeners will be very jealous of you living in florida because i imagine the distinction between house plant and garden plant doesn't really exist you can grow stuff outside that only could be grown inside certainly here where i am in the uk so tell me about what you like to grow and how you like to grow it well that's a good way of putting it the distinction is very blurred for sure i am at this point much more of a gardener uh as i like to think of it than a houseplant person i um am very lucky it's something i literally used to dream about when i lived in new york is just having soil outdoors just to put plant stuff in because again i grew up where that was just a given you know you could go out in the woods and stuff and uh, i was so d deprived of that in new york that i just wanted to garden i think wherever i would have moved uh out of the city that's what i wanted and that's what i would have done i would have just you know had a garden and had a planted things in the ground and luckily i ended up somewhere that um here in southern florida it's what is a U.S. Uh, zone 10 climate, which means it has not frosted since we live here. lived here. Um, doesn't really ever freeze. Maybe once in every 10 or 20 years we'll have something like that. But you can grow pretty much any tropical plant that you could think of outdoors, sort of, with some exceptions. Some things are super sensitive. And it's a lot of fun. So I feel incredibly lucky. Um, we moved into this house with a little kind of residential lot yard that was completely empty for the most part. A couple of trees provided some nice shade, but not really any landscaping to speak of. And I look at, looked at it as my blank canvas, and I've had so much fun just sticking plants in the ground and putting them where I think they would look good. And it's I, I try to share on my Instagram and, and my Patreon and stuff as much as I can some of that progress and how things have grown and my trial and error. And, but it's just, you know, my biggest joy in life really is just that, that garden and growing those things and experimenting. And, and, uh, there are downsides to growing in this sort of climate. Um, probably the biggest one is just that for most of the year, it's not pleasant weather for people. Um, I, the plants love it, but it's so hot and humid and sweaty. And then the bugs love it too. Every, you know, you could go out there and just everything's got spider mites and mealybugs and aphids and thrips on it. And the leaves are crispy because it hasn't rained, uh, literally hasn't rained here in two or three months because it's the dry season. So it's not a tropical paradise out there right now. It's really pretty rough. Um, and then in a few months, it'll rain every day and then things will be rotting. Um, so it's, you know, everything's exposed to nature and you've got to manage that. It's a different, it's a different world than the houseplants. But I like that 
I have a, you know, the sink or swim attitude with the plants, you know, they, they've got to, I like the idea that I can stick something in the ground and, you know, even if I go away and just leave it, 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 it can do its own thing. I don't have to babysit it. And that appeals to me a lot. I know exactly what you mean. I lived in Louisiana for a couple of years when I was, when I was young, <laughs> when I was doing my master's degree. I mean, to me as an English person arriving, I was like, it's like I've walked into a steam bath and it's just a totally different, like the speed at which things grow, the size of the insects, <laughs> everything just blew my mind. So I can imagine it is really different. But as you say, I'm sure lots of people who don't live in that kind of climate, um, who live in a more temperate climate like me, just imagine it to be some wonderful jungle where nothing ever goes wrong. But actually, I imagine that things can go wrong quite badly. Oh, many things go, everything, everything goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but it's, it's a intense struggle, you know, you're struggling against nature. Um, but it's reward, enormously rewarding too. And, you know, when things go right, they, they grow fast and it's a lot of fun. So a lot of successes and a lot of failures <laughs> have you got any favorite plants or big success stories to share I, I would say if i had to highlight one my favorite plant out there is i have an australian tree fern i might butcher the latin but i cyathea cooperi and i think at cooperi and i think it has a bunch of synonyms because the who knows what their actual genus is but i got it in a little one gallon pot it was a you know a foot tall um fairly early on after we moved here, I looked up all the care instructions and um, I dug a big hole, put a bunch of peat and compost in there because they like really moist soil. And the soil here in Florida is it's just pure sand. It's incredible. If you'd never, you know, if you're used to any other normal part of the world and you put your hand in the dirt, it's not dirt, it's beach sand. So the, a fern does not naturally like that except for when it's raining all the time, which is not always raining. But anyway, um, you got to find the right spot for a fern to be happy. So I put it near the house on the north side where it would be mostly in shade, kind of covered by a tree a little bit. And it's just done amazingly well. Taller than me, it's got a about a two-foot uh, trunk that's forming. In three years, it's just exploded in size. And I've always admired the tree ferns at the Botanical Garden because they're so prehistoric and you know, you get that dinosaur plant feeling. They're so, it's like a very ornate palm tree. And I just love the look of them. And to be able to just have one growing out there that looks so crazy like that and is growing so fast, it makes my day every day when I look out the window and see it. And I bet you don't have to wrap it in winter like we do here. Like in the UK, people. That's true. You, you can grow that. That's true. You can grow tree ferns in the UK that you would grow a, a Dixonia more likely they're a little more cold hardy down in cornwall and right in the south far southwest where it's the mildest part of the uk people do grow those um cyatheas um but they still even then they uh, and dixonias but yeah they have to be kind of wrapped in straw and all this kind of stuff so no it's it's um you know there are plants where theoretically on a cold an abnormally cold winter you know we're gonna have some damage here with some of the things even this winter there was it it got almost down to freezing and a few things looked a little worse for the wear but i think the tree fern is pretty bulletproof in this climate so yeah it's it just needs a lot of water what's it like going to a garden center in florida what would i be seeing how, how are things are i can't even imagine how it would be arranged because everything the the divisions that i'm used to here in the uk don't wouldn't really exist it's funny because, um, you know, there are a lot of the big, you know, in the U.S. there's Costa Farms. I don't know if the, I guess they wouldn't have that in Europe, but um, they're based, you know, not too far from here in Florida. And they ship their house plants all over the country. And the a garden center or a plant uh, store is, or a nursery is set up the same way here where there really is a distinction between the house plants and the outdoor plants which is rather arbitrary here so they'll have you go in to this like shade house and they'll have the little pots of the begonias and the but then you, they'll have some of the same plants in, in larger pots outside uh you know a few feet away so they, there's an they do make the distinction still and i don't know why 
But I think people occasionally will come to Florida and think that they're just going to walk into a nursery and find some, you know, priceless aeroid and it's going to be really cheap and they can, you know, buy a bunch of plants that they can take north and, and sell to their friends or something. But um, it it's not, I don't think it's that different compared to how it is in most other parts of the country. There are uh, certainly things like uh, monsteras and palms and stuff that just do the sheer size of the plant. You know, you would pay a lot more for the equivalent plant of North. And that's just due to the shipping costs. But as far as like selection, especially in the past few years, the plant craze and the plant shops that have opened, I deal with plant shops to wholesale my work. And I, I know there's some great plant shops and even a lot of small towns all across the country. And if you're interested in rare house plants, I don't think you're even going to get better prices on that stuff in Florida right now than you are in the rest of the country. Maybe a little bit better prices, a little bit better selection, but it's not a different world. Uh, unless, like I said, you you want like a, a big palm tree or something. Well, it's been delightful to talk to you. Uh, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you wanted to mention? Any new projects coming up or things that you wanted to highlight? Um, no, I think that I think that covers it really well. It's been uh, lovely talking to you. I have really enjoyed it, and uh, I've been a like I don't know if I mentioned I've been a fan of your podcast for many years since you know when I first started getting into house plants in New York. It's been a delight listening to you, and it's thanks for having me on. It's been a, a joy. So thank you. My pleasure. I mean, I didn't invite you on just because you listen to the podcast, but obviously that helps. It's been really fun to talk to you and I'm in awe of your incredible talent and uh, I'll put all the links to your stuff in the show notes for everyone to go and have a look at if they're not aware of your work. Yeah, I, I've, I'm, um, I, you know, like I said, I've finished that big project and I've got a big list of things I need to paint. I'm going to be working really hard this year and painting a lot of stuff, so... Follow me on Instagram and there's going to be a lot of exciting stuff happening. So I'm excited to just share all of it. So Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Thanks so much to Aaron for joining me this week. And do check out the show notes for some images of Aaron's work and also links to his website and Instagram. And if you're an arty person, I'd love to see your houseplant creations. Do send them through and I will share them on my social media. It's wonderful to see that you're such a creative bunch. That's all for this week's show. I will be back next Friday. Just you try and stop me. Until then, keep your aspidistras flying and your begonias blooming. Bye. The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Young by Kumiku, and Whistle by Benjamin Banger. The ad music was Deal Pickles by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details.